What is up, brothers and sisters? Welcome to the Mitch Gray Show. You get a double episode this week. Look at that. Um, I have never I'm trying to adjust things here. I have never done two guest episodes in a week, and this week we're doing it. So, if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, you can see to my left, your right, I've got a guest with me. Before we get into that, make sure you go um, check out a copy of the new book, The Gathering Place. You can order that anywhere you order books. As you can see on the bottom of the screen, Barnes & Noble Amazon is a place to be. If you want an autographed copy, make sure you uh, message me and we can make that happen. Um, go check out the new music, the new EP, The Stars Tell the Story is out. And it is a re I'm really, really proud of it. Musically, the best thing we've ever done. We have a few show dates coming up that I'll be posting soon. And um, so be watching for that. Follow us on social media, at M. Gray Media. And make sure you subscribe to the show. So many of you are watching the show, and even this week, we interviewed Meg Dahl on Monday, and um, it was like, so many people, yeah, we watched it on Facebook, we watched it on YouTube, I'm like, awesome, go subscribe to the show as well, um, that way you can get the audio, ver audio version of it and uh, check it out, so, and now for my second guest of the week, you guys are making it hard on me, man, I gotta learn all these new questions and make sure I'm getting all this, is this exploratory information, so... <laughs> I love it. Um, brothers and sisters, I want to welcome to the show uh, Mr. Jaden Isler. Jaden, welcome, man. Hey, thanks for having me again. Hey, you're what, I told you this morning you're my guinea pig because I've Thank never you. done this uh, in the studio. So um, for those watching on Facebook or YouTube, we're going to just have a conversation and we're going to enjoy some time together and hopefully share some knowledge and wisdom. So um, Jaden, you were on my old show, uh, Soul Food for the Chicken. Yeah, it's probably been two, two years, years ago, maybe yeah, three. Maybe yeah, it's three. been a while. Um, so you've you've not been on the revamped show, and so I wanted to get you on. So what's up, man? How's life? Hey, it's good. It was it was fast and furious for a while, and and yeah. through basketball season and new job and all of that. But uh, it's finally slowing down towards the end of the year here. But it, it's been great. Awesome, awesome. So for the guests that don't know you, um, Jaden is the boys varsity coach at Clovis High School. That's the town that I'm based out of in New Mexico. And uh, for a long time, Jaden was the varsity girls coach at Elida, um, much smaller town. Yeah, much smaller, <laughs> much smaller. Uh, but that's all right. I'm from a small town originally anyway, yeah. so it, yeah. it wasn't, wasn't too hard for me to be there. But, yeah, glad to be back in Clovis and yeah. glad to be home and, and uh, you know, just enjoying my first year. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jaden also teaches school, um, basically world history, yep. to sum it up the best. Um, so Jaden is one of those guys that is uh, one of our educators and influencing our young people. And so I always love to have folks like you on because you're kind of the everyday people that are really making a difference in society. So first of all, thank you. I, I, I know it's not easy. <laughs> um, second of all, I kind of want to get started this way. What made you get into teaching? Not coaching, teaching. Teaching. Well, honestly, um, you know, I always knew I was going to be into coaching, uh, whether it was staying at the college level or or in some other facet, but I didn't have an education degree. So uh, whenever I started coaching is really when I decided, hey, I need to go back and I need to go get my teaching degree and all of that. So I'm in, I've been in the process of that for three years and I'm in the last class right now. So nice. about to have a full-time teaching license. Uh, that'll be good for another five years and work on my master's. But uh, both my parents were teachers. Yes. My, gran my grandma was a teacher. Actually, both grandmas were teachers. Yeah. Um, all my dad's aunt or all my dad's sisters, my aunts were teachers. So teaching runs in the family. Um, you know, they always told me go do something else, but uh, <laughs> I think it I think it runs in the family enough where uh, I ended up here anyway. Yeah, it's in your blood. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I know your your dad's sisters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from your yeah, past. Yeah, Fort and, Sumner. And and so um, yeah, great people. Your that whole family just just good people, man. So and you're you're following that legacy. So. Um, so your dad was a coach. Um, for for those that don't know, he's kind of a kind of a legend in the state of New Mexico, especially in uh, made it made his massive impact early on in the small class mm -hmm. um, basketball, and uh, and then later at Clovis, and then later on went on to coach uh, co some at the collegiate level for a little while as well. Yeah, so. he's, he kind of his career kind of took him all over the place. Um, started in started coaching girls at the one A level, just kind of like I did, and. Uh, Instantly after that, I think he won a state championship his first year, got runner-up the second, and he took the New Mexico Junior College girls' job. Wow. Uh, he was the youngest Division One head coach uh, when he took the University of Texas Arlington job. And then he came back and started coaching boys kind of yeah. when we were born. So 
Uh, he's kind of been all through the girls' side of college, girls' high school, boys' high school, and then uh, actually coached me my senior year at McMurray University. So right. he's he's kind of had the full circle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he's kind of been all over. Yeah, yeah. And you're following his steps. Yeah. Um, you know, didn't didn't necessarily – start out that way right. uh but you know after after his accident and uh, that kind of threw me into high school coaching which yeah. i didn't expect to be in yeah. but uh you know all of our stories you know don't really uh go the way we plan all the time and, right and right. so it's been a, it's been an interesting journey it's been a hard journey at times it's been one of of a lot of success at times so that's yeah. kind of that's kind of life in general so um dealing with teenagers every day and you've done it this is your is this your fifth year sixth year this will be my fifth year. Fifth year coaching, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, what What are some of the? Let's start with the challenges. Um, what What are some of the biggest challenges dealing with um, teenagers, especially in today's? I always tell people, you know, I started in actually in youth ministry when I was uh, nineteen. Uh, that was in nineteen ninety six, so a right. long time ago. And I always tell people, the human behaviors don't change, but the cultural engagement changes which actually does impact um thought and behavior and so what what are your what are your challenges thoughts Uh, well you know and and you said it really well but um you know kids kids don't change a whole lot as far as their their behaviors and our kind of innate behaviors but um you know social media is is new and that was a challenge that we didn't have to work around uh not that long ago right um you know, even when I was in high school, I think was when Facebook came out, and yes. and so I mean, it's it's fairly new as far as our our generations, but they've grown up with it their whole lives. Right. Um, you know, that's something I see a lot, especially like in class and yeah. uh, just being around the high school every day. Is is man, we're we're glued to to our phones, we're glued to information. Yeah. Um, so one of the hard parts, and something we try to do with our teams, is is to get them away from that and to really talk to each other really be present with each other yes um that's a big thing for us trying to build chemistry um you know because i I don't think kids always uh you know have the face-to-face the interaction anymore that's that's something that's huge to us but there's challenges i mean uh, kids are going through puberty and they're i teach sophomores so you know they've 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 (laughs) just got of it (laughs) they've just got to the high school and uh you know first two weeks they don't say a word they're all nervous they're all scared and then about four weeks in they're off the walls and they run the place. So <laughs> yeah. it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's cool to be around that. It keeps you young for yes. sure. Yes. Um, one, one thing that, uh, you know, I have the advantage of is, is being younger and being able to, right. Right. uh, you know, being able to relate more to, to the kids. Cause I, it's not been that long since I was kind of in their footsteps. So yeah. That's, yeah. that's one thing that I have an advantage of. Yeah, I told someone the other day that one thing I always try and do when, when I feel kind of chaotic, especially with social media, is I always, I always think, okay, I need to go back in my mind to pre-computer, right. pre-social media. <laughs> because I was telling someone the other night, you know, even in high school, we, we didn't have computers. Right. My family didn't have a cell phone. My, I don't know any of my friends that had cell I mean, you know, especially the cell phones that were out then were A, yeah, this big a giant bag phone. <laughs> <And that. laughs> so it wasn't the convenience that we see today. So people just didn't have that. And and there was um, there was a different peace and serenity and engagement with people um, because we, we just didn't have all, have all the noise. Right. And so um, so while while technology and social media can be challenging, we also know that it can be a useful tool as well. But I, but I I'm like that as well with with teenagers. It seems like. Um, the distraction is constant, mm-hmm. whereas before technology and social media, the distraction wasn't as constant. So. Right, and uh, you know, a good example we had we had state testing this week uh, at the high school, and so uh, I was a test proctor in one of the rooms, and they have to put their bags by the door, their phones have to go up during testing. Well, our group got done about an hour before the finish time when they could leave for school, and. Um, they couldn't go get their phones and they were, they had an hour to kill. And I mean, this is just an hour. I mean, yeah. think about your, your day. This is just one hour. And for the first 20 minutes, they were freaking out. They oh, could not get their phones. They were like, we're so bored. We don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. And I was like, guys, there was a time where <laughs> you had, you had to kill an hour without a phone. And, uh, you know, what? about 30, 40 minutes into it. I mean, they're, they've made paper balls and they're shooting them into the yeah. trash cans and they're talking and laughing and, uh, you know, it, it, it can still happen. They yes. just, they don't have it away from them enough, but yeah. uh, the creativity and the stuff is, yeah. is still there. It was funny for me. Cause I, I think, uh, 
I think kids are, are creative, and oh, but yeah. it gets taken away sometimes when, when they're distracted. Right, but, right. right. Uh, that's yeah. it's just an example of how how kids are today. Yeah. I mean, they freak out sometimes when right, they don't have right, it. Right, right, right. Um, so those are kind of the cons. What about the, the positives? You know, it's kind of interesting because right now, politically especially, um, you know, education is kind of on the table in, in a lot of states um, yeah. across the board nationally. In our state especially, it's – um, things are changing. Everyone's trying to adapt. You know, I, I, don't, I don't get I don't get frustrated really one way or the other because it is political and mm -hmm. it's ever flowing and always changes. But um, you're in the political you're in the in the educational world every day in a public school system. I like to talk about the positives. What what are the rewards? Um, a lot of times people only see the negative and the frustration, but there are rewards there. Yeah, a hundred percent for me, and it goes into my coaching philosophy and my and my teaching philosophy is is just creating relationships. Yeah. I mean, you get to create those relationships on a daily basis, um, and you know, testing and and which tests are going to come through for your state, and are they going to get rid of. Uh, evaluations for teachers and all this stuff that yeah. everybody worries about but there's always going to be a new thing come through uh, when they kick something out yeah. something new is coming in so that that stuff and and that's just because I've had family that's been teachers so they've been right. through all the changes and right. and right and that's something they told me as well so I, I focus on the relationship part I mean yeah. if you can create relationships with your kids um, you know you can help kids that are struggling a little easier because they trust you yeah. Um, the ones that aren't struggling, that you're just creating a relationship for whether it be sports or just in the classroom for later. Um, that, that's the cool thing for me. Yeah. And that, like I said, that goes into my coaching philosophy 100%. Right. Um, that, and that's the first thing whenever I interviewed for this job here that I, that I told the school board and the, and the people that were on the committee is uh, I'm huge on relationships. You yeah. can't make change without relationships. So uh, that, that would, that's one of the big positives for me. Yeah. Yeah, life life is definitely about relationships. Period. Um, and there's always the human level. I th I think we make the mistake when we forget the humanness, um, and and forget that we're dealing with another person right. who has emotions and thoughts and ideas and blood pumping through them. I mean, at its most basic level, there is another human being there. Right. And so often we do forget that, especially in the systematic world. Um, and education can be very systematic, but. Okay, let's shift to coaching, uh, one of my favorite there we topics, go. <laughs> <laughs> not just with sports, but, but um, I, you've kind of alluded to it. I, I believe um, no matter what your venue is, the approach and the principles stay the same. Um, and I know you've kind of taken that same, uh, that same outlook on life. So I kind of want to back up a little bit. Um, you were a great, a great player um, in your own right and had a lot of success. Mm -hmm. Um, when did you kind of either know you wanted to go into coaching or when did you fall into coaching? <laughs> yeah. I, um, well, you know, I, I played my last year of college basketball. I knew, so my senior year, I knew I had to do something after that. Um, and I was in between, I was going to play, uh, Hal Mummy, uh, who coached at New Mexico state was at mm -hmm. Kentucky. He was the football coach at McMurray at the time. And, uh, I had worked out for him, and he had offered me some money to stay and play my, my fifth year. You can play right. a different sport. So I was going to play football that year and um, try to finish out my degree. I still needed a couple classes. Yeah. And uh, my, uh, my coach, my junior year at McMurray, who I had won a conference championship with, went to the national tournament, he had taken the job at Wayland Baptist. Mm -hmm. And he had offered me a grad assistant spot there. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I wasn't quite graduated yet, they were going to pay for some classes. and. Right. And so that, that's kind of where that decision came. Was I going to do uh, football and then, and then go on about whatever I was going to do with my life after that or, or jump on with him? And, and I had so much respect for him. He's one of my closest friends to this day, and especially after my dad's uh, death. He's a huge mentor for me. Um, I talk to him weekly still. And, uh, you know, I just I felt like that's where I needed to be, and, and I wanted to work with him. Right. And, and it ended up being a great experience for me. Got my foot in the door with – college coaching and recruiting and, yeah. and all of that. And I wouldn't give that up, but that's re that's really my start there. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, what would you say are, are as you're coaching and dealing with these teenagers, um, and, and Clovis last year was your first year. So you're kind of rebuilding a program, yeah. um, a, a program that historically speaking has had 
a ton of success. Right. And um, quite a few players come through. You know, right now on the girls and boys side, we've got a couple of players that are that are playing Division One, all, all divisions mm -hmm. really. Um, we've got one player right now that's playing professionally. Yep. Um, and so, so this program and this high school has had a lot of success. Um, what was your kind of approach coming in? Um, I, I've, I've been a part of rebuilding processes in a variety of capacities. And it's this weird thing because you can't come in saying you're going to change everything. Right. Because then no one will listen to you. <laughs> right, right. But you have to come in knowing, I kind of got to change a lot of stuff, you yeah. know. And so what was your approach kind of coming in and taking over a new program for you and rebuilding and – yeah, uh, kind of two things. Uh, when I, whenever I decided to go ahead and apply for this job, and and once I got it, um, two things kind of had to happen. Number one, we had to get people excited in the community yeah. about basketball again. Um, I Clovis perennially like football and basketball when they're both doing well. Yeah. The city is a different city, right? I right. mean, the, the, the vibe around the city, the, the excitement level, it's, it's completely different. And I got to experience that as, as a player here, right. and I wanted my kids to get to feel that. So right. one thing, um, we encouraged our kids to try to branch out and play both sports. Right. Um, our best athletes needed to be in both sports, one, to get stronger during football season and, right. and be competitive. Um, and like I said, we needed to get the fans and the, and the city back excited about the program again. And uh, the only way I know how to do that is, is to, number one, have kids that play really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to the relationship part, mm -hmm. if you can't, if you don't have a relationship that's built away from basketball, away from the floor or your sport, you can't get a kid to go to run through the wall for you. Right. When right. you say it, they respect it. You, you've got to build the relationship first. So uh, right off the bat, um, we just jumped in. We hadn't, we hadn't, hadn't even had a practice yet and jumped in and went to a team camp uh yeah. the very probably three days after i got the job right and uh took them to a team camp where we had to stay overnight we had to be in hotel rooms yeah. and you're together uh, yeah and, <laughs> and you together. know and like i said just try to try to get them away try to get us all together uh try to remove the 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 phones from the hands yeah. and and just be present in the same room together and try to build that that chemistry right, right. away right. and and that's that's the thing uh, is just trying to build that camaraderie where um, you know, they're going to put a performance on the floor, whether it's win or lose, right. that people are going to be excited to watch and, and feel proud that they're at the game and that's their team. Yeah. And that, that was a huge step in this whole rebuilding process. And we, we didn't know what our wins total would be this right. year. We didn't right. know, uh, we didn't really even know what a great goal would be in this first season. Me and my assistant coach, uh, Corey Pickett, we talked about it a lot uh, once he was hired on as my assistant. And, you know, we were thinking, hey, maybe – maybe 16 wins, maybe yeah. maybe be able to compete in the district. We, we weren't sure, but, man, things sure turned around pretty yeah. quick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, those things apply. Um, for, for those of you that may be watching, and we're kind of uh, – Jaden's profession is coaching and teaching, so we're going to relate it to that. But what I want people to hear is the things you just said are applicable whether you're a manager, a CEO, a, a parent, um, a, a teacher, a pastor, whatever – um, and I've kind of experienced that recently and in being involved in some work where we're kind of rebuilding the culture and laying a new foundation. And that's exactly right. It's the old saying, people don't care how much you know right. until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. And when you have a team of people working for you or in sports playing for you that you're teaching, it is. It's, it, when, once they know you care and once they know you're out for the betterment of them, they're going to do anything. Yeah, anything. And in sports, it is running through a wall. And at the workplace, it's 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 um, getting to work earlier or being more prepared or reading yeah. books that prepare them. And so if you're listening out there and you are a manager, boss, CEO, that applies. I'm telling you, if you're out there right now and you're having a struggle with your team of people, I'm going to give you one free piece of advice. We're not going to charge for this. All today. right. Okay. We'll get to it. And the free piece of advice is if you're struggling with your people, take them out to lunch. <laughs> take, them take them out, out to, to lunch, buy them some coffee, get to know them, ask about their family, find out how they're doing. That's when you'll start seeing things shift. I want to add to that. We're also never, and I know you're not this way. We never want to be the people that are insincere, right? We're not, we're not in it to build relationships so that people perform, right? We're in it to build relationships so that people are healthy. Absolutely. And, and to, to back off what you said right there, being insincere, the best way to, to, uh, to know if you're being insincere or not, kids will, they will kids smell that out yes. instantly. Like yes. you cannot, yeah. 
if you are fake in any way, yep. especially kids and especially high school, like yep. sophomores through seniors, they will call you out as, as soon as yep. they can. Kids are better at that than adults. Absolutely. And they have no filter. <laughs> no, and, and they will let you know. Yeah. They yeah. will let you know. So I think, I, I think you really hit it on the head there. If, if you're insincere, people can tell. Yes. It, does, it yes. doesn't matter how much you're trying to hide it. Yep. Um, and, and to back off what you said, for people that are um, you know, in charge of people at all, if you're a CEO, you're a manager, you're, uh, it doesn't matter your profession, yeah. um, but people want to feel valued. Yes. You're, you're creating yes. those relationships, but if, you're, if your employees don't feel valued, yeah. then I mean, you're not going to get their, their best performance. And, and like you said, we're, that's not what it's all about, but uh, people need to feel valued. Yeah. They need to feel their worth. They need to feel why they're doing what they're doing. Right. Um, performance is a byproduct Absolutely. of healthy relationships and healthy culture. Um, and I want to get into that. I'm, I'm really big on culture. Um, I think you can actually have a team of healthy people and still have an unhealthy culture. I think those are two ve- – it doesn't just happen by nature, a healthy culture. Right. Um, you really uh, – you, I know that was a big task for you mm-hmm. um, because I know there was some re- – you mentioned it kind of community-wise. There was kind of – um, this stagnancy in the community of of the basketball program specifically. Right. Um, so you you took the kids, you built relationships, you put them in situations that they kind of had to build those relationships and they had to learn about each other. But what did you do to rebuild the culture? It's one thing to go to a team camp or to have cookouts or to do all of that to check on a kid. It's another thing um, to get, continue that and then the kids become self-sustainers and i know from your coaching style you're a coach of leaders yeah absolutely. You, you don't want teams of followers and how do you do that what what were some things that you did coming into a new program new kids building relationships how did you start changing the culture well i'll tell you this it's as far as year ones in in my profession and coaching especially when you're working with with kids is year ones are are so fragile yes um and and somebody asked me about culture um a while back and and i told them that uh winning is a huge factor to can your culture sustain Mm -hmm. if you find any type of that success because you're going to build the trust so we did the relationship part right okay and we worked that all through the summer and you get to the season okay now you've you've bought them they're bought in they're trusting you okay you've built that relationship now, if you go out and start losing, and you you <laughs> lose challenge. you lose three, four, five in a row, yeah. that that trust yeah. and that um, and even trust in themselves on right. following you, right. uh, that that it's so fragile. Yeah. And and so people always say, well, if you build the culture, the the results come, which is true to yeah. to um, you know an extent. But uh, something for me is you have to find a way, and that's something as coaches, like we had to find a way in our first five games of the season and we played the number one team in the state our second game we played a team from uh uh, from texas that already had 10 games when we played them our very first game of the season and so you've got some adversity sitting right in front of you how do we help our kids find that success early to where your culture is then solidified a little bit right and and that's that's a big deal so you know when we came in after the summer we knew we had to help them find that success to where okay that belief has been solidified now yeah. they know you, they know you have their back they know the work's been put in and then and then your culture can start growing from yes. there and our and I saw our culture grow all season long we had we had a really tough schedule in front of us the kids were put in some hard spots yeah. um, but the early success kept their belief even when we'd have a you know you have a down a down game you have a game you're supposed to win and yeah. maybe you lose it um, but those early successes of maybe beating somebody you're not supposed to, yes, yes. Uh, because they were just bought in enough to play really, really hard right. early because right. of the relationships. Now, now you've kind of solidified it for the year, and, and now you, you, you know, we had a chance to go win 20 games and win the first district championship in uh, yeah, I don't know time. how long. long so, time. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a, a huge key, and that's something that maybe not everybody agrees with: is the uh, you have to have some success before your yeah. culture can take off, but. Uh, in my in my opinion, if you don't give them some of that success early, there's always um, some doubt in yeah, yeah. in the process. Um, I, I agree 100. percent And let's let's define winning. Um, you hear a lot of 
um, social media influencers or motivational speakers, and they th the word winning or win gets thrown out a lot. Mm -hmm. And I always like to define things. And for those of you that are listening that may not be coaches and may not be, um, you know, you, maybe you just have a team of people or you work with a team of people, I also want to apply winning for you. So in sports especially, people say, well, we have to win. But that actually comes in many forms. Absolutely. Sure, the ultimate form is we're going to win 90 to 86 right. on the scoreboard. Yeah, scoreboard. Yeah, or if you're in sales, you're going to win by hitting your sales goals. Or if you're a teacher, you're going to win by your kids doing really well. But winning, you know, to, in my opinion – for that situation you're talking about, it's it's giving one kid on your team the goal of 10 rebounds a game. And when they get that, that's winning that moment. Yeah, it can be very small. Yes, and, and small. for others um, in the business world or in other worlds, it may be winning for you, maybe finishing that book that you're writing or finishing a chapter today. Um, winning for you may be recording that first song or it might be just getting your team together and setting some tangible goals. I think where people miss it, and I've seen this when people are goal setting, um, and I, you alluded to something earlier I want to circle back to, but I think people set these massive goals, but they, what they forget is you have to work backwards from those goals. So you have to go, okay, yeah, in three years we want to be here. How do I get there? Well, we can't hit three years today. Right. How do you get there? <laughs> and so that's another way I see people defeat a cultural growth is they set something so high in expectation that no one's going to achieve it. Right. And you want to destroy someone really quickly? That's a great way to destroy someone yeah. really quick, to set them up for true failure. Right. And, and uh, no, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So I was just go backing on what you said is, uh, you know, everything, everything in life is almost backwards planning. Yes. I mean, almost everything you, you're ever going to do, unless it just happens to you in the instant. So, <laughs> right. I mean, so if you give somebody something that's too, I mean, too unattainable that they don't, they can't understand how to backwards plan for yeah. Then that that's what you're talking about setting them up for real failure. Yes. Give them. I mean, you've got to give them. If you're going to set that goal that high, there better be a plan that you can help them backwards plan yes. for it. Yes. Yes. And and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about winning. I think so many people have such a narrow definition of winning, but for you to take those kids and win 20 games, it began one moment at a time, one quarter at a time, one half at a time. Yeah. <laughs> one positive effort. And and I knowing you. I can tell the people that are listening, I can promise you, I can hear you on the bench, in the locker room, in a kid's ear going, nice job, yeah, good job, do that again. Mm -hmm. And I think we miss that so many times, especially in the workplace. For some reason in the workplace, people get really weird. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's like, no, you come to work, I pay you, do the job. Okay, that's fine. You can function that way, right. but you're not going to have a very you know, strong team. Right. And you're not going to have very much success for very long. It's got to be that that that. A uh, constant um, effort of Jaden, nice job, man. Nice, do that again, and then we're going to work on some other stuff. Absolutely. Before you know it, that culture is solidified. You know, now you're going into year two for that business owner going into the second quarter or third quarter or whatever. You're just building a foundation, and Absolutely. then you can build on that foundation. So, uh, something to something to talk about right there is, uh, and, and I can relate it to the coaching world really easy. Um, and, and I'm a vocal, vocal person on yeah. the bench. I, I'm with Wait, my kids. You? I'm with my kids <laughs> up and down. I, I still feel like I'm in the game down the sideline. But um, something you can talk about right there is like people see um, any of the any of the negative. So hey, maybe we've got to get on a kid because he's missing an assignment. He's right. got to get there. He's got to get it right. done. Or uh, you know we're taking him out of the game and we're we're you know talking to him pretty rigorously about yeah. what he's got to get done for us to be successful. People see all of that stuff right. because it's that those are the loudest moments. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Something they don't see is, uh, you know, like the little thing that a kid does in a game yeah. that we are ecstatic about. Yeah. Um, that in the in the flow of a game, we don't have time to to maybe. You can't stop the game yeah. and run out. And be like, yeah, five, maybe bro, maybe job. we don't go do it right there. <laughs> yeah. But when they, the yeah. next time in the timeout, when yeah. they're nobody can hear anymore, yeah. and we're saying, heck yeah, man, like that was perfect, yeah. perfect. Keep doing that. Yep. You guys are doing that great. And, and those are the moments you don't hear and, right. and relate it to the business world. Uh, you know, everything seems and you're like, people get weird in, in work. <laughs> but, you know, every how many emails do you get from the higher ups in your right. in your job that are, hey, gr hey, you're doing that awesome. Like you yeah. like you said, most most of the time, if you're getting an email, something's going it's wrong. Negative. Something's yep. going wrong. Yep. Yep. And and so, you know, you can encourage people that are in a workplace setting that, you know, you've got to have those moments of. Uh, hey, you did that awesome. Yeah. 
there's you feel value in that you feel your worth in that and now you feel inspired to do that and then when the negative stuff comes like when a kid comes off and we really get after him right because uh, he's not doing something that we have to have done right and we are really at him yeah. um number one the trust has already been built right so that's not a negative even though it's it seems negative it's yeah. not a negative thing right um and you've already built him up with all the little yes hey you've done really great there yes. and so it, it's not personal it's not it's not a negative to to the coach and the kid right so in the workplace uh when when you're getting feedback that's criticism or hey we need to do this better um if that relationship's there first yes and if they felt valued on the things they've done well already when the criticism comes it doesn't feel like a negative it feels right. like hey we're just going to change it and get it done right yeah that that is so it's it's like the old i think in the late 80s and this is going to sound weird to apply it to but i think it applies there was a book that came out, and I cannot remember the name of the book, but it was about relationships. And the guy that wrote this book talked about in a relationship, you have to have a love bank. And so basically you're doing enough good for each other that you're banking up value, value. so that when you have those hard, chaotic days and you don't get it right, right. you have enough room to make what he called a withdrawal. So it's kind that's of like cool. going to age. Kind of and, and, and it apply, I think it applies to, you know, obviously in that book it was about relationships, but I think it applies to everything in life. We have to have enough trust and have built enough trust and have built enough that on the day that I need to come to you and go, Jaden, man, whatever, whatever, whatever. Right. And we have enough trust in each other that you can look at me and go, yeah, that, that's exactly right. We're going to get that right. You know, obviously in a, in a kid coach relationship, it's a right. little different, but it really, it's not, it may be packaged differently, Yeah. but the motive is the same. And, and you're right. I think people, uh, I think people see that from an outsider looking in and they misconstrue what's happening. Now I want people to know too, we're also putting aside the, the there are, there are realistic situations that become abusive mm -hmm. and verbally abusive. And we're not supporting that. What we're saying is in the healthy relationships, that's how it's going to look. Yeah. And, and it's your job as the CEO, the coach, the manager, the parent, it's your responsibility to make sure that relationship is healthy enough because if you haven't, in my opinion, you don't have a right to do the things you're saying you can do. Yeah, absolutely. You know? uh, you, you've got to, I mean, the trust and the relationship has to be built, number one, because then if you if you come at somebody um, passionately yes. and in the moment um, that you haven't worked on that relationship with, yeah. it's everything will feel completely personal. And for kids sometimes, uh, you know, they're working, they're at a young age where they're working on Hey, when I get feedback, it's not always personal. Like right. he, like as soon as this game is over, uh, like I, I try to hug every one of our kids, yeah. win or lose, after every game, yeah. after we get done, yeah. and um, you know, after the game, all that's over. Right. Hey, I'm gonna be. Right. We're gonna be passionate in the moment. We're gonna strive to be the best that we can be, and I'm gonna hold you accountable, accountable. to that, yeah. so you have the best success possible. Yeah. But I, but after the game or after that practice, when we're out of the moment. I'm still going to hug you. I'm right. still going to tell you I love you. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, so that, that just goes to uh, show you that you have to build that first or everything feels personal. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, if you don't build that, nothing else matters. It doesn't. Nothing else matters. And I love that. Um, that, that that's what's called affirmation. And I think people miss, um, especially in, in your industry, in the coaching industry, but in the workplace, too, I think people miss the idea of affirmation. Um, and that is what you just did that, Hey, we're going to get through this mm -hmm. and you know, I, I'm holding you accountable and I'm pushing you hard, but I'm pushing myself hard, but I'm affirming who you are and where you're going. And I'm telling you, if you set a pattern of affirmation, it changes the total projection of mm -hmm. culture and success and opportunity. Oh yeah. People that feel valued and affirmed are going to grow leaps and bounds beyond even what we can imagine for them. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and, and I mean, the whole goal with kids on a team or yeah. people that are working for you is uh, what you said earlier. We don't want a team of followers. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to teach them how to lead. Yes. And, and when, they, when they feel affirmed and, they, um, and they're able to understand the whole big picture of why we're doing what we're doing, why we hold you accountable, why, why do we hold you to a standard to be better for yourself, once they get it and it clicks, and hopefully it's, it's by their sophomore, junior year, right. then – we don't have to do as much. <laughs> right, I mean, that's they, true though. Once they understand, yeah. once they understand it for themselves, and they yeah. know we trust them, and, and I mean, that's when they lead, yeah. and, and we as coaches take a back seat, yes. and we we can let them 
do then you become do. a guide. Yeah. That's all yours is a guide and a support. Mm -hmm. and, and people that have healthy, um, whether, it's, whether it's in sports, whatever occupation it is, people that have a healthy atmosphere, that's what you see. You see the CEO or the coach or the manager or even the parent. You know, that's what we learned as parents is, honestly, our goal was once our kids got to be sophomore, juniors in high school, even freshmen, we really wanted them to be on kind of learning to be on their own. Right. Because as a parent, your objective is – to raise and create an opportunity for healthy young people who can become healthy adults who do the same. And I, I'm pretty proud of what we've done as parents, my wife and I have done as parents, because literally by the time our kids were freshmen, sophomore in high schools, they were doing so, you know, so many things on their own. And it was like, yeah, that's a good job. And that's, that's the same application anywhere. Um, I see a lot of times in workplace situations where managers or bosses kind of have this attitude of, well, no, you still need my approval or you mm -hmm. still need this. And I'm like, no, 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 you're, you're yeah. constantly going to have turnover. You're never going to have happy people. And right. honestly, when you go to bed at night, you're not happy either. Yeah. I mean, who likes to be micromanaged, whether you're, yeah. whether you're a kid that's right. talking to their parents. I mean, right. once you've taught them, you don't want to micromanage. First of right. all, it makes way more work for you <laughs> and you're exactly stressed right. out. And then, yeah. I mean, you can look at it as a CEO or a coach or whatever. Yeah. I don't want to have to micromanage everything you do. If no. I'm micromanaging, we're not very good. Right. If if right. if you're micromanaging as a parent, that means you don't you don't have a whole lot of trust in what they're doing. Yeah. If you're micromanaging as a CEO or a manager of, yeah. of people, that means you don't have any trust and you haven't built any trust in your right. employees. So And what I found is those people that do that actually don't trust themselves. Probably. There's a lot of insecurity there. And the insecurity is they, they usually find their security in their position. And I had a guy tell me one time years ago, he said, Mitch your goal should always be to work yourself out of your position because you've raised the level of the people that, that around work, you. Yep. That, that all of a sudden you're not needed anymore. And that's always stuck with me. And that's always been my approach. And I think you could apply that to sports. Yeah. You know, you want so much independence and teamwork and such a healthy culture that you could not show up to the game and everything would work just like you weren't there. You're exactly, yeah. you're exactly right. Um, and I, and I'll give you the example of when in, in my years in Elida, um, Going into our last year, or my last year there, uh, I'd had girls that started as ninth graders that played on my team as ninth graders that were seniors that year. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of the full circle of they've been through your right. culture system. Right. And uh, I got caught behind a fire. Um, this is when I didn't have an assistant. I got caught behind a fire in uh, in between Lovington and Elida, and oh, jumped geez. the road. Can't get to practice. Oh wow. Um, and so, you know, you're thinking, hey, this is a wasted day. I'm stuck yeah. behind this thing, and, yeah. and all this goes on. Well, uh, we finally get across, and I, I get to the gym, and it's, uh, it's been two hours after school. Yeah. And I, sh I show up to the gym, and they're, they've worked themselves out. They've done everything that we do. They've gone through it. We've got leaders wow. teaching. Wow. We've got them stopping and helping the young ones. Yeah. And I just I sat back by the door and didn't even walk in. I just I sat and watched it for a while. But that that's what you're talking about. Right. When they don't need you, you you've done a good job. Yes, that's exactly that's exactly right. First of all, good job. Or you're not a good or you're not a good <laughs> coach, and they really don't need you. You just sit down anyway. I highly doubt that. But yeah, that's, that's a great that's a great example, man. That and that's what we want our people doing. That's what we want as people. Um, you kept talking about value, and, and one study that's been out oh, probably for probably 30 or 40 years, and they kind of come out with it annually, but the satisfaction, uh, the motivations of satisfaction at the workplace. And every single year they do this, the first thing is either happiness or value. Or value. And money is always down the list, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And that, to me, just shows you that the relationships are important, the development of people and self is important, but the value and affirmation is critical, that if you don't have that, um, if people don't go to bed at night and go, you know what, I had a hard day, but I feel like it was worth it, Right. then you're going to lose them. You're yeah. going to lose them. Yeah, motivation, I mean, motivation's huge, yeah. and, and people, especially adults that are working, um, you know, your motivation can be wiped away if you're just, yeah. if you're miserable and don't feel valued and, yes. and all the things you just said. If, yeah. if you don't really have a, a want to get up and go to your job in the morning, right? I mean, even if you're making money, it's, it's a miserable way to, yeah. to exist. Yeah. It's not the long game. You mm -hmm. can't play that forever. So um, you're coaching high school kids, you're teaching high school kids. At the end of the day, 
what is your motivation? If, if I were to ask you at the end of the day, Jaden, what would let you know that you've done a good job? What would that response be? Um, it's definitely not, it's definitely not the, the answer that, that you would think. I mean, the, the good thing for me is I was able to have success really, really young in my first years. Yeah. And, and so I've gotten to the, the pinnacle. I've gotten to win the state championships. Right. I've got the multiple ones where, you, you know, and that in the moment, that's, that's great. But um, I think it was, I think it was Tony Bennett uh, from Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, he had, he had a quote a while back where um, he was talking about after, after winning it, um, kind of, kind of feeling depressed. Yes. And, yeah. um, and maybe it was after an ACC championship. Uh, maybe it was before they won this year, but right. Uh, he, he had the feeling of depre like being depressed and yeah. having depression and um, because you work so long because yeah. you think that goal is right. uh, that just to win it the all. The ultimate. That's the ultimate. And yeah. then, but nothing changes. As yeah. soon as you're out of that moment, and, it, and it's wonderful when you're in it, right. but as soon as you're out of that moment, you're back recruiting or you're going back to practice, and, and you can feel that, that depression from that. So if that, if that is your ultimate goal, which you're striving for that, but if that's what makes it, for you, uh, it, yeah. it, it it's a really miserable profession. Right. Um, so for me, um, my deal is I want my players to have the best possible experience. I I was lucky enough as a player to get to go to those big games and yeah. be in those moments, yeah. and and that's what I wanted. And I told our team that to start the year, um, there hadn't been a team go to the pit in Albuquerque, which is where we play our right. uh, state championships. Right. There hasn't been a team. None of these kids have ever even been there for a game, right, like right, at, on, right. on the floor. Yeah. And I want them to get those moments. So for me, um, mine is just trying to make my kids. And and I literally pray uh, during every national anthem, yeah. and every time I I pray for my kids to be able to number one, just play the best that they can with their abilities, um, and to inspire people. Yeah. That's the second part I pray about. And, um, and then the third is for, I pray for them to get to have a moment that they didn't think they can get to. Right. Um, and, and for our team right now, and like that moment is, Hey, we need to get to, uh, yeah. the pit that that's what drives me. Yeah. It drives me to get them to moments. They, they haven't been to yet, or they, right. they want to get to. And yeah. if they accomplish that, the end result, it may be a state championship, maybe beat in the first round. Yeah. Um, but if they get to those goals that they didn't have never been to and they haven't got to yet, um, that's what makes – that's kind of what drives me coaching-wise. Right, right. Yeah, which in your, in your profession is um, actually a really sustainable motivation because every year you have a new group of kids. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so – It's a different it, goal. It'll never run out, you yep. know, because you've got, you've got a new group of kids coming in. Or, or maybe in two years you've got five or six kids that have done it, but you've got three or four that haven't. And so – um, yeah, and that, and that drive that that makes me a better coach anyway because, um, like you said, you get a whole new group. So maybe if you've just accomplished getting a group yeah. somewhere or winning a state championship, yeah. the very next year you've got kids that weren't on that team, right? That they deserve a shot to get yes. to that moment or to the moment that they want to get to, and uh, that's what drives me kind of through the summers. And and you know we don't get paid in the summers, but we right. go do a ton of stuff and right. and we're working all summer. But uh, I feel like I'm cheating their their dreams and their moments if yes. I'm not working and, and working towards that goal. So right. it dry, it makes me be a better coach. It drives me, um, just by trying to help them. So yeah. that, that's kind of my ultimate goal as far as year to year with kids and yeah. what to do. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Jaden, before we finish up today, uh, give, give the listeners, uh, I, I want to do two things. Number one, give the listeners maybe maybe we have some teenagers that are out there listening to this. We actually, I know for a fact, have a few that do. Um, maybe we have some parents that are out there. Maybe we have other teachers that are listening. So, number one, what would you tell? We, we kind of started the show talking about all the differences in being a teenager today. Mm -hmm. um, what what would you tell a kid today? Um, maybe one or two pieces of advice to give them about how to live their best life today. Not, I, I, I feel like we deal with teenagers so much as projection like in the long future. Term. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, but they're living a life now. And I kind of fell into that personally and it kind of set me up for, um, 
the unrealistic expectation is as a teenager, I was always looking 10, 20 years down the line. Right. What am I going to do? What I forgot was to enjoy the moment. And then what it did is it set me up for like as an 18, 19 year old, I thought, man, I'm going to accomplish this, this, and this. And then you don't. And it's like your what, world. Falls what have apart. I been doing? Exactly. Yeah. And so I love to deal with teenagers in the moment. So number one, um, for those people that are either teens or dealing with teens, what, what advice would you give for those teens to live now? And number two, um, what advice would you give that person who may be listening, who woke up this morning and went to work and doesn't feel valued? Okay, let's start with your first one, especially for teenagers. Um, be in the moment. I mean, be in your moment because uh, – especially for teenagers now, they may not be looking ahead long-term like we kind of try to guide them to be. Right. But, um, you know, there there's so many moments going on right around them um, that there are so many distractions in today's world, and, and they're good at times. But uh, if if you're in your moment, you're not going to miss today. Ah, uh, yes. And, yes. and that's, the, that's the biggest thing is – uh, and and we're all guilty of it even now yes. uh, as adults because we are on social media. We're, we're looking on ahead, phone. like it's like the yeah. next moment, the next moment, yeah. or what is somebody else doing? Yes. And you're missing your moments. Right. right. Um, and and that's something I'm guilty of. I'm I'm looking at somebody that's accomplishing this or this on social media, or I'm just not in my moment. Right. And I you know I have my niece um, at home right now, uh, and she's my only niece right now, yeah. and they don't get to come in a whole lot, and I find myself. Uh, you know, on my phone or doing something right. at the house, and I'm missing my moments yes. with with my people that I love. So, yeah. for teens and and for adults to um, be in your moment, so you don't miss yours. Yeah, I love that. I and, love that. And uh, to go on to your second question was about um, yeah, maybe someone's out there that's not feeling valued at work. Yeah, uh, and that's or even a teenager at school. You know, we yeah. we and you're at a larger high school. Um, you you came from a really small high school into a larger high school. And I, I've dealt with a lot of teenagers that are in large high schools, especially. Um, and for those that, that are listening as well, just to give you a frame of reference in, in our local community, the last what two months or so, um, we've, we've had some young people that have made some decisions um, to, to either take their life or thought that life wasn't what they thought it should be. And, and we, we remember those kids and anyone that struggles with that. But we just, there's so many people, I think, walking around us um, that don't feel that value. Mm -hmm. And some of them, you know, maybe some of them are just working to make ends meet. Maybe they don't have the ability right now to make a transition. Maybe a kid is in school because they kind of have to be in school and they feel like they don't have any room to operate. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about value and a healthy culture and being a healthy person, yet we have all these people around us that are struggling with that. What would you tell that person? Uh, it's, and it, this is adult, kid, teenager, doesn't matter. Have people. I mean, that, what else are we here for? Yeah. Like, we're not, we're not solo beings that just have, are to ourselves. Right. Like, we need yeah. people, yeah. and we need community. We need uh, to be social. That's, I mean, that's why social media is so huge, because <laughs> that right. drives us as, as people. We're, right. we're born that way to be social with other people. Yeah. Um, so people that are feeling that way, you don't feel valued in your job. You don't feel valued in your life as a yeah. young adult, and, and as you're coming up, uh, into your adult years, you don't feel that way. You've got to have some people around you yeah. that you that that support you and and give you some affirmation or give you that value um, when you don't feel it yourself. Right. And I, I think that's big. In, in my darkest moments in my life, yes. um, it, it's been people that have been able to uh, help bring that out of me. I mean, and and I I mean I'm a person of faith, and and sure. obviously that's where I go number one. Yeah. But um, you know, physically here on, here on earth, like you have to have people in your corner. You have to have that. Maybe it's one person, maybe yeah. it's three, maybe it's your little core group. Um, you need to be able to vent when you don't feel valued. You need right. to be able to, um, get out your frustrations and you need somebody that's going to give you, uh, good advice back and good feelings of value and affirmation yeah. back until you can, um, find a better situation. Right. And that takes courage. Absolutely. I, I, I think a lot of times we forget, um, reaching out to someone, you know, sending a text or making a call or asking someone to go out to lunch. Mm -hmm. If you're in the moment of not feeling valued, that takes courage. And, and oftentimes I tell people that might be the most courageous thing you do mm -hmm. is to reach out to someone. Yeah. And, and especially, um, young men yeah. today and, and, and men in general, uh, yeah. because that is not what we feel is, is, uh, the strong thing to yeah. do. That's not what we feel is the 
like you said, the courageous thing to do. Yeah. We think we should be able to handle everything and we yeah. need to be the, the leader and deal with our own stuff. And yeah. um, for young men especially, and I think in most, um, you know, most suicide and most people that are feeling that way that go into those depression feelings, yeah. um, you know, most of them are men. And most of them are young men. And uh, I think that's something that's a stigma. It's, a, right, it's, right, right. it's something it's kind that... Of a culture, it's kind of a culture. Uh, it's kind of an American culture. Um, my dad and I were talking about that one time, and he made, a, he made a comment. He said, well, it's actually the whole culture we've built of pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Right. And although there kind of is some good to that, that's yeah. also kind of a pile. <laughs> right. Because there are moments in life that I can't pick myself up. Right. And you don't feel like you, and you, don't feel like you want to pick right. yourself up right. out of. And, and I think for our young men, if we've got any young men listening – um, you know, it is not, it's not a weakness when you get in, in that type of moment to, uh, to, you know, ask for help, ask for yeah. advice or vent or, or whatever needs to happen. But, um, that's where people in your life come in and, and you got to have good people around. Yes. You. Yes. Jaden. Thanks, man. Absolutely. I yeah. appreciate you having me back on. <laughs> this is, uh, this is, this is new for our people that are watching. This is the first time I've had someone in, in the studio, to uh to have these conversations and to do the podcast and so i'm glad you were the first one man i appreciate because you uh, me i've already learned a few things from this that i don't want to do next time <laughs> <laughs> there you go and so i needed that so um brothers and sisters as always i just want to end the show today thank you number one for watching or listening uh and and number two i just want to tell you um as we were having these conversations and talking all i could think about in my mind was Maybe you're the person listening that doesn't find value in life right now, or maybe you're the person listening that you're treading every day, just plodding along, going to the same job, going to the same school, dealing with the same people, and you get to the end of the day and you wonder in your mind, is there something else? I want to tell those people, yes, there is something else, number one. You'll find it if you keep searching. If you seek something, it will arrive at your doorstep at some point. Number two. I want to tell you that you are valued and that um, humanity often misses the moments that really matter. Don't miss those moments. And if, if you're the only person you feel you have, look in the mirror and tell yourself you, you love yourself. By the way, try that. It's really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> but it works. Um, I know I went through a dark time in life where all I could do was look in the mirror and say, I love you. I love you. And it was weird at first, but it works. So if you're that person, at minimum, Make sure you love yourself. And as you start loving yourself and as you start taking care of yourself, those people that Jaden talked about that you need, I believe they'll arrive exactly when they're meant to. So, brothers and sisters, may you feel value today. May you feel love today. May you feel peace today. And if you're a manager, CEO, coach, teacher, or parent out there dealing with young people, Jaden gave you some great advice. So make sure you go back, watch the show, listen to the show, take some notes, and learn from a man that is doing it every day. So, Jaden, once again, thank you um, for coming in the studio early. And uh, you already went through a cup of coffee. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to need one. <laughs> so thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure I'll have you on again soon. So, brothers and sisters, have a great day, and we will talk to you soon.